Hey Axis and Allies players, this is a good captain. Welcome to another video on Axis and Allies Classic. And today's video is a re chronological review of my 10 part series um, several months after the release. And I'll be going over where I was wrong, or where I had my mind changed, or where I felt I could be more clear. Everything I'm stating here has been annotated in the description boxes below each specific video. So this video is just in case nobody reads those description boxes but sees all my videos, or if you want an expanded discussion or to hear me speak more towards the areas in which I uh, annotated in those description boxes. So um, one more uh, point of housekeeping before we get into the content. Uh, none of these None of what I'm about to go over was so egregious that I felt I needed to pull any of the strategic videos or any video in that series at all. So if you're expecting me to completely overturn any of my strategies, you're going to be disappointed. But there are a few key areas that need to be addressed. And so the first video is titled Know the Rules, and other than that video being split into two parts, I didn't quite know how to video edit it at the release time of that video uh, was released. I think that one's a very good video, and so is video number two, Winning. I think those two are in fact probably the most important out of that 10 part series, especially if you're coming out of playing some other version of Axis and Allies and you need to know the key differences very quickly about this game in terms of uh, the, the rules and the victory conditions and their implications on the game, those two videos are uh, key, I believe. Uh, number th video number three is more or less an artistic endeavor, uh, so I won't be touching on that. However, video number four, the first strategic video, is Russia's strategic video. In this one, I have two points where I either changed my mind or, in the case I'm about to discuss, was wrong. And it was wrong of me to state that I didn't care if we played with Russia Restricted or not. Russia Restricted is vital to balancing this game. Um, without it, and I'll, I released in a whole video, for those of you who may not be aware, I released a whole video on Russia, titled Russia Restricted and why you need it. So go check that out if you want to hear the in-depth discussion uh, where I talk for, I think, 20 minutes and show examples of how it, it's, uh, it creates an imbalance and how to, what to do if you're not restricted. But essentially, if the Russians can, they should absolutely do a full firepower attack with everything they have, uh, or nearly everything they can, in a, and attack Ukraine. Not only do you get gain three IPCs, you destroy all the German units, and the Germans will be very hard pressed to take that territory back without taking away from somewhere else on the board. So it really ratchets up the pressure on Germany on the first turn, and creates a, a, a very, very, very difficult situation uh, for the Axis, and especially Germany, to start the game out with, and neither Axis power has even taken its turn yet. So, um, I, I, again, I, I'm restating what I already stated in that video, but definitely play with Russia Restricted. For those of you uh, who know me, uh, I, I do, I'm trying to stay in box rules, right? So, the Russia Restricted rule is still in the rule, original out-of-box rules. So we're still, I still haven't um, kowtowed to any kind of buy yet or um, house rule change that needs to be uh, impl applied here to balance this game. Um, but I haven't made up my mind just yet. I'll get to that at the end of the video. So that's probably the biggest thing out of this whole video about how I had my mind changed because that was shown to me by uh, a couple of very fine fellows on the forum um, and they it showed me how devastating this was and, and even played a few games with me to show me how hard it is for Germany to, to come back. And it's not impossible. In fact, in one game I was able to take the Russian capital with Japan still, but uh, Germany did fall and they had, the Allies had, uh, the better army in the field. So, the second uh, point of amendment in regards to Russia requires me to sort of move my units the way I do in the non-combat movement phase of Russia's turn. So I'm going to push some units around real quick, but if you want to see the full in-depth why I'm doing this and what I'm doing, uh, check out Russia's strategic video and then come back and watch this part. But otherwise I'm going to be going through this pretty quick. So I move one troop to Novozibirsk, one armor to Novozibirsk, and this 
infantry goes here, one infantry from the Soviet Far East goes here, and this uh, sets up a nice solid defense on the Soviet Eastern Front. Um, over here, we move up uh, all the troops except for one blocker at, from the Caucasus as well as Russia. Um, so we'll have 11 infantry here, and I like a clean board, so uh, we move both fighters into Karelia, and then I, I moved three tanks down into Persia, and then these Russian boats reinforce the British. Now that's, that's my first turn non-combat move since Russia is restricted. And the, where I had my mind changed was down here with three tanks in Persia. Now this is something that I did for a, a, a few different reasons. One, I stated that it deters the German attack into Africa, which it might. Uh, the other and primary reason is that you can do a, a neat little trick with Britain um, and you'll have to check out my British video to know what uh, what that trick is and it also gives just in general it gives the Russian player a lot of options because these things move two spaces and they're in the middle of the board and they have the greatest influence here they can go into Africa they could go into India Xinjiang they could go back over to the Soviet Eastern Front the Soviet Western Front you see here um, how valuable that position is and they are untouchable there Okay, nobody can do anything to them on this turn. So, um, but I said three tanks um, and do at least two. I'm changing that now to don't put more than two tanks in here. Two tanks is the right number. And one tank, the tank that was in Karelia, should just simply stay in Karelia. And why I am saying that is because after you place your eight infantry builds, which is my recommended build in Karelia, for Russia, you'll have 19 infantry, one armor, two fighters, and an AA gun. This is the necessary defense to properly deter a full force German attack into Karelia on turn one. If you don't have that tank, the Germans have something like a, uh, a mid 70s to high 70s percent chance of taking this territory over uh, with most of their air and a ground unit left um, and just to make sure that the dice don't with respect to the fact that Russia could get diced in that battle and Germany could have more land units than that I move one tank back this reduces the percentage chance of that happening down to the low 60s and increases the likelihood that Germany will have to pay several more air units to keep that ground unit in Karelia and take that territory. Where am I getting that from? The beautiful AAA battle calculator. That's where I get it from. I thought of doing a cutaway scene to show you how that works, but if you've watched any of my videos, you know how to do that. You can run the numbers yourself. It's very simple, and you can check it out for yourself if you like. Okay? So that's it for the Russian strategic video. I just had those two, uh, two points of discussion. And then we get to the German strategic video. Of all of the strategic videos in my series, the German strategic video had the most hits and had the most uh, pushback. The strategy that I advocate in that video, I, I didn't realize how, mm, I, don't, I guess, controversial it would be. And the main part of that, of course, is not attacking the British and Russian fleet uh, around the UK. I was prepared to have my mind totally changed on this thing, but of all the strategic videos, uh, the only one that I have nothing to say in regards to is Germany. I don't just double down on everything that I said in that video, I triple down on it. I, I now, with, with a high level of confidence, perform that strategy in virtually every game. So, Anybody who plays me in the future, you have the benefit of knowing almost exactly what I'm going to do every time. And I say almost because there are a, there's one or two things the Russians can do differently that will uh, force my hand in a different direction, or slightly different direction. Uh, but generally speaking, that strategy is solid and sound, and I honestly had nothing to say about that video. Moving to the UK turn now. Uh, and I, this isn't just out here for fun. We, we are going to get to this towards the end of the video. Okay, the UK uh, goes third, and in that video, I, I don't really have any major corrections except for one small but important one, and that is in regards to 
the fighters on the UK itself. So there's two fighters that start out here. They stated in the video that they should land in Karelia to help defend, but the Russians aren't, again, they don't need it to repel that German attack as I previously discussed. The uh, best place to put them, in my opinion, is the Caucasus. This move takes all four of their movement factors to get there, and uh, there's, there should be a Russian blocker there. Um, arguably, the Russians could push this AA gun up, up if they wanted to as well, just to deter any kind of German raid into that. Um, but more than likely, the Ukraine, the, the German player, I haven't moved, moved all his pieces, but on his turn one, um, more than likely, if he's, uh, I, in my opinion, if he's a competent German player, he'll have dead zoned the Ukraine, or otherwise have no significant amount of units there. If he does, this this move is obviously not the right move to make. You don't want to risk these fighters. But um, if on Britain's turn one, uh, it's fairly vacant, then they should move here. Why? Because from the Caucasus, they can reinforce India or they can reinforce the Union of South Africa. Now, uh, this is the key, the Union of South Africa. And just to show you that they can, they can move one into Persia, two into the sea zone east of Anglo-Egypt Sudan here. One, the sea zone east of Kenya, Rhodesia, and then there is a little, uh, this touches, this is a legal move, uh, you move four into there. So at the end of turn two, uh, one, both, or all three of the British fighters could be in South Africa. Why am I saying that? Well, if you have a German player who hits Egypt on his first turn with something like this, and in my strategic video, this is what I recommend, Something like this, and let's say all three of these British two defenders are wiped out, and for whatever reason, because it can happen, inflict no hits on the Germans. These fighters would fly back to Libya, Britain would take its turn, and if you're following, again, you might want to check out my British strategic video to completely understand the amendment I'm making here, but on my, my build, recommended build is for Britain to build two industries. So at the end of turn, and you'll need to move this blocker up to prevent a blitzing tank from taking it, right? So at the end of turn one, we kind of look like this in Africa and in the Caucasus. Just ignore everything else here. And if the Germans decide, and they probably should, uh, to come down and wipe out this blocker, um, on Britain's turn two, you really only have the option of building two units down here, and this industry looks pretty screwed. But since we have these two British fighters in the Caucasus, they can move down and reinforce after you build whatever two units you want here. Um, and potentially you could even move the third fighter down here if you needed to. Uh, this is a much less uh, palatable uh, situation for the German player. Not saying they won't attack, but uh, this is a, um, a, a very tough nut for them to crack at this, situa at this juncture. So that's why I put those fighters there, especially with after they've gone through three British two defenders, they're more than likely to have taken a hit at this point. So they usually won't be this strong, but they could be, they could be, okay? Again, the middle of the board provides the most options to influence the rest of the board, okay? All right, next is Japan. That's all I had for Britain. Next is Japan. I could have done a better job of being a little more forceful about what to do with Japan, but now that I've run the gauntlet, on AxisAndAllies.org and played a variety of different players and played and pressure tested all my strategies. I want to reinforce a few things. In that video I stated for the builds that two transports and three infantry was a solid build. I now don't believe that's the best and most optimal approach. I think building three transports is the best and most optimal approach and I will explain why. Just bookmark that comment for now. I'll explain why as we get later into the video. So set that aside. There's our three builds. Then on the combat move, I state on the first turn you should really only attack China. And to do this we move in all six of our infantry. And then every fighter and bomber that can reach. So we got three fighters, one bomber, and uh, six infantry. And the goal is to wipe out all three of those American units on one shot. 
and you're likely to you'll definitely like you're highly likely to take one hit and you're it's very it's probable that you'll take even a second hit so it's it's not uncommon to have four troops left after this turn if you're lucky you have five a little less than lucky you'll have three but it needs to be done and this is the situation the board is in when you come to your non-combat movement phase one other point that I wanted to do amend making the Pearl Harbor J1 attack do not do that that is um, that just gives the Americans an opportunity to destroy very powerful fleet units that the Japanese cannot afford to even risk to lose on the first turn so early in the game. German air and, and Japanese naval units and air units for the Japanese are, are really, really irreplaceable in the early first few turns. The Axis should husband those units uh, they are worth way more alive in the mid to late game um, than the exchanges for the units that you would destroy on that first turn for the allies. The exchange rate is not good and I highly recommend never doing that attack. And what you should do, I think, uh, is move all of your units um, up into the Jap Japan Sea Zone. Okay, like so, and the Philippines Island Fighter flies onto the deck of this carrier, and there's a reason for this, I'll explain in a moment. Um, so, uh, and then this is where, um, this is where I was a little tepid and said that I would move my fighters to, you know, whatever the situation dictated on the board, baloney. Move everything into Manchuria, absolutely. All three fighters, the bomber, and those two transports that just moved up here, one of them can take off the guy from Okinawa, um, I bring one off the Philippines and then I bring two off of Japan. This is the move that I always make and this is the move I always execute so that we have four infantry, three fighters and a bomber. This is a perfect defense against all, even if all seven infantry were able to attack with that tank, the odds of success are in the high 90s for the Japanese and the, the most probable unit count loss is barely four pieces for the Japanese. So. Worst case scenario, you might lose five pieces, but in that case, it is extremely highly likely that the Russian army has been obliterated, in which case that is a great exchange, because Russia will have to either ignore that front or, or replace it, uh, pieces that were lost on that front, which is great news for Germany, okay? Now, uh, about these American units out in the Pacific, why didn't, if without the J-1 attack, you know, what, what the heck? Like, the Americans have so many options at their disposal. It might look at, like that at first glance, but again, uh, it's, it's not as advantageous as you think. In fact, um, it's, it's extremely disadvantageous to do anything other than vacate the Pacific. It, let's say that the Americans stack heavy. You can run the battle calculator yourself, but I'll just show you what the Japanese can and should do on their turn two. Remember how we built three transports, so now we have five if you push that entire fleet with both fighters on the deck into that C zone, you're going to win. But wait, there's more. You can move two fighters from off of Manchuria to land on the carrier, while the two that were on the carrier can land on Wake, or the Solomons. And you can also bring this bomber. You will wipe out every American unit, and you're highly likely to only lose three or four of your um, transport slash co submarine covering fleet. And in that case, if the American player did it, you did this something like this, you absolutely should. The best thing the American player could do if they wanted to maintain a presence in the Pacific is do something like this. Okay, this way they can't be destroyed. But in that case, there's more options for the Japanese player, and I simply don't have the time to go through everything. Some things can just be played out on their own and found out on your own, but what is most likely going to happen is the Americans will retrograde their fleet, which is a perfectly good move to make as the American player. Okay? Okay. There was one other thing that I wanted to talk about in regards to Japan, and that was, I stated in the video, in that video, I think there's an argument for buying an industry on the first turn as Japan. And I'm going to address that very quickly right now. I've only done it a few times in solitaire play, not even in my play group but I'll, I'll go ahead and tip my hand so you can see what I'm thinking. So the British player builds two industries and now there are only two left. They're all communal builds, so once these are built, no player can build anymore. There. So 
Japan goes, and it's really not a good idea to build a, an industry on the first turn, right? Right, except for when it's America's turn, they have the option of building both of these suckers, and you might be thinking, well, that's a waste of money. But the American player, these two industries aren't just a, a total burn. They can double down with the British and place a industry in Xinjiang. Um, where would you put the other industry? I put it in Alaska because whatever, uh, once you have a fleet up here, or if you build boats up here, they can immediately go into the Japan Sea Zone um, uh, the next turn. So uh, this is obviously a J, uh, kill Japan first type of strategy, in my opinion. If this you didn't like this, you could and didn't want to put an industry in Xinjiang because you were worried about Japan taking it, you could place it in Brazil. And I know that seems bizarre, <clears throat> but uh, Brazil is not a terrible place to uh, build build troops and units and shuck, uh, shuck to um, Africa or reinforce the British in South Africa if need be. So again, I'm not, I'm not dying on this hill. You, this could be a completely stupid idea, but it's, it's, well, it's not completely s silly. It's, it's competitive. Uh, it's not a game changer or a game. It doesn't break the game one way or the other. It's just something that I've contemplated and haven't actually um, played in a game just yet. It's something I was thinking about, and since someone asked, I decided to explain that in this video. Okay, now we get to the American strategic video. In that video, I stated you should build your units here, push them up into eastern Canada, <clears throat> and start building transports, sending them up here, and then event with the eventual eventuality of having transport group here, then shuck back and forth, dumping them into Finland, Norway, or Western Europe. They can even go to Algeria and or um, Germany and Eastern Europe. Okay, so that still stands true, but I, I no longer recommend placing them in Eastern USA. Ground units should never be in Eastern USA. They should all be placed in the Western United States. And why are we doing that? Well, that's where this piece of paper comes in handy. Uh, notice here that the large Hudson Bay Sea Zone on the top left side of the board, which is the sea zone we were just looking at, is adjacent to the Western Can Canada land territory on the top right side of the board. So that sea zone borders this landmass, which means, which means that on America's turn one, we can push units here and whatever land units were built can be placed in the Western United States. Maybe Alaska comes over here. And now these guys are ready for deployment into Norway on the next turn. But on their way there, notice that they're not only protecting Western Canada and Western USA uh, directly from uh, ja the Japanese, as the, because the Japanese are going to wind up and sort of threaten, uh, take out Australia, New Zealand, and Hawaii, and threaten the Western seaboard. So this sort of build setup and, and pushing the units into Western Canada protects both of these land zones and creates dead zones out of West Mexico and Alaska. Okay. So this is a free, a very cheap, easy, like I, I dare say f completely free way of dr drawing a line and saying this is the point at which the Japanese uh, can go no further, okay? And uh, I had that again pointed out to me by uh, one of the very fine fellows on AxisAndAllies.org, so thank you for that. Um, and the last, the last thing I wanted to cover, I mentioned in my USA video that building a ton of transports up to something like, I think I said 8, 9, 10 even, <clears throat> of course that wouldn't be built in, uh, you know, one or two turns. That would be adding a transport or two over a long haul. But someone pointed out that the IPC count doesn't make sense and that at a certain point you wouldn't even be able to shuck all of those troops that you built because you'd have too many transports. In other words, there's just a ton of empty space. Yes, that's, that is a true statement, but it's a little short-sighted. The reason, the main reason, I, I think I replied to the comment that you can extend your shuck. In other words, you could have groups, two groups of transports, and then threaten Southern Europe or any, uh, you know, the Mediterranean, through the Mediterranean via Algeria. But really the main reason you want to do that is Transports are big, or basically like a bridge, 
and having eight, nine, or ten transports is building a wider bridge. Just because you build a certain amount of land units on a given turn doesn't mean you have to shuck them that turn. Um, and take it, take it from me, who plays the Axis a lot, when the Americans build up a large, large transport uh, fleet and simply stages an army on, in the, one of the Canadia, uh, Can Canadian land zones, then it makes the German player, it forces the German player to act as though that army is going to attack Western Europe the very next turn. In other words, it's going to draw, force the Germans to pull and place more and more troops into France instead of sending them east. Okay, so hopefully I explained that well. That is the last um, area that I wanted to explain how I had my mind changed or where I was wrong. Um, in terms of the strategic videos, video number nine was a knock against Don's essays. Uh, the only thing I have to say about that is that I have nothing to say about that. I really do believe. I've, I got a lot of pushback for that too, probably more than the German video actually. But those essays are, aside from not being terribly, actually just aside from being poorly written, the concepts in there, if you, if, I, I just have to insist on this, if you play the, this game over and over, you, you, these things will come to you, you'll see them naturally, you'll start to react to them. I, I did, I just didn't put names on it, so I credit him for being, you know, he has naming rights, he got the names of these things like Dead Zones and the Shuck and uh, the Strafe Attack, but again, uh, nothing super groundbreaking in there, and I think it was harmful in that this still is sort of, everybody knows what I'm talking about when I say Don's Essays. Why? The strategies recommended in Don's Essays are questionable at best, in my, and this is all again in my opinion. Uh, but the biggest thing is that he states he solved the game. I just find that repellent. I think even if you're watching my videos and you think that's wrong, I have an idea that can defeat that. I, I would never say you're wrong for thinking that, but that's what he does. This game offers a lot of different variations and variability, and I always leave my mind open to being changed or wowed. So that's it. Thank you for watching this. All the best from the good captain, and bye-bye.